And to those joining us from around the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're here in Santa Clara, a few of us, uh, respecting all the protocol of the safety for all our employees. My name is Sergio Villotta. I'm the site manager of Santa Clara ST Sites. I'm here today with Paul Sayak, our executive uh, vice president of sales and marketing in AME region. Today, we want to welcome all of you to a very special event. That is perhaps a bit unusual for, uh, for our uh, ST office. We have invited a very special guest. ST Americas is honored to welcome Federico Faggi, a pioneer in the semiconductor industry and longtime Silicon Valley resident. Federico started his career at Olivetti first, and then joined ST Microelectronics in Agrate. He has made enormous contribution to the semiconductor industry, beginning as an engineer with his development of a ST first metal oxide semiconductor silicon gate technology. At Fairchild, he invented the self-aligning metal oxide semiconductor process technology and buried contacts, techniques that are both widely used today. Federico, from his time at Intel, invented the first microprocessor, the 4004, which then he later developed also the 8080. Of course, as many people here in the Valley, that was not, not enough for him. He started his own company, Zilog, and later he started also Synaptics, another company founded by him. He also served as a president and CEO of Fovion, a company that made image sensors. His efforts have been recognized and rewarded with many awards around the world. The Kyoto Prize, Japan IGAS Private Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts and Sciences, and the National Medal of Technology, the US highest honor of technological achievement. He's also the recipient of the Wallace McDowell Award for outstanding contribution from the IEEE Society. Computer Society, the International Marconi Fellowship Award, the Gold Medal for Science and Technology from Italy, and the European Inventor Lifetime Achievement Award, and many, many others. As arguably, he is the father of more circuit and processes. Federico is here today to share his own experience. And uh, he compiled and he written this book, Silicon, in which he just tell us his, uh, his life and his journey through uh, the first phases of, of his life, from his childhood uh, in a very small town in Italy, through his life as an inventor and designer, to a successful entrepreneurial efforts, and now to his devoted to studying the mysteries of consciousness, where he is again creating new models and explanations that are breaking new ground. So thank you for being with us, Federico. It's a great honor. And I let Paul now drive our Q&A session with Federico. Know more about uh, his journey and uh, his new ventures. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sergio. So as Sergio said, we're live from a, a vaccinated room uh, in Santa Clara. And again, I want to thank uh, Federico for being with us. Uh, we were talking before uh, about this being the 50th anniversary of microprocessor and you being the pioneer of that. Um, I was wondering if you could take us through from uh, your your hometown of Vicenza and your studies in, in Padua, how you ended up at coming to SGS Fairchild. Right. Um, so I was born in 1941, uh, wartime. Um, after a year and a half, my father decided to move to a small to a village, Isola Vicentina, because uh, the Allied forces were coming through Sicily and they were soon to be in the north. So I spent my first six years after that, after, you know, so from from one and a half to seven and a half in a rural uh, village uh, where basically in many homes there were not even electricity. Uh, they, you know, the uh, farmers were still using plows with, uh, you know, pulled by, by oxen. oxen. Yeah. I mean, just an unbelievable, you know, uh, unbelievable when you think about it with the eyes of today. But so anyway, so I, I experienced uh, how people lived 200 years ago. 
and uh, my first language was the Venetian dialect, uh, uh, so which I still speak very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, as long uh, with, well, so with English, yeah, 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 yeah but no, uh, next was Italian. <laughs> 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 but in fact, the first the first day of school, uh, um, uh, I, I, I understood half of what the teacher was was was, was talking because uh, everybody speak dialect in yeah. in the village, yeah. so you know Italian was a new language for me, so. I had to learn that one first. Anyway, so uh, uh, I grew, you know, then we moved back to Vicenza, where I was born, where my father was a professor of philosophy and uh, history at uh, Liceo Classico and also University of Padua. Scholar, my father uh, wrote about 40 books, uh, translated the uh, Enneads of Plotinus uh, uh, in wrote about many philosophers, uh, especially, especially idealist philosophers like Schopenhauer, Meister Eckhart, and so on. So uh, I grew up in a in a home that was quite cultured. My, my mother was an uh, uh, elementary school teacher, but I, I didn't care about that stuff. I really, uh, my, my first love was model planes, and uh, I decided to, uh, I saw one when I was 11, and that's it was love at first sight. So I had to build myself one and then two and then three. And so I still build them and fly them. Um, and, uh, uh, but I had no money, so I had to figure out how to, you know, how to design them and make, make them. And uh, I bought a book, first book I bought with my money. Um, and, uh, and I was self-taught essentially, except for the book. And, uh, that was a fundamental experience because he, he essentially gave me a 12, an experience of how you actually build a product. Because the product, you first you imagine it, then you had to draw it, figure out, you know, a plan. You make a plan, then you buy the material, then you construct it, then you assemble it, and then you fly it from A to Z yeah. at 12. <clears throat> In fact, I never had any trouble De designing anything yeah. because that experience gave me the entire 360 view of how you build products. You have to manage every aspect, every of, aspect that. of it. You have to you master know, But it all comes from the mind. Yeah. It all comes from that, you know, moment of imagination where you now then it becomes, you know, a the first trans transfer from consciousness into drawing, which is you know, some memory on paper. And then from there it becomes physical. Yeah. So that that process is the process of invention. Um, I I went to a technical high school uh, to the chagrin of my father, who of course wanted me to study the classical IC, mm -hmm. but I couldn't care less yeah. about Latin. Yeah. <laughs> so and even less about Greek in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so uh, I graduated the best of the institute by long shot. But the point is that right after I went to work for Olivetti, when mm -hmm. Olivetti was a major force in office systems and computers, they had uh, announced in 1959, they announced their first uh, uh, transistorized computer at the same time as IBM had the first transistorized computer. So uh, they were fairly advanced for, for, for those days um, compared to the, to, to the US. And I worked in Borgo Lombardo. I started in 1960, toward the end of 1960, and I spent the entire 1961. And I was lucky enough to uh, be given a project that eventually became my project to design and build a small experimental computer about the size of, say, the, the, the 4004 and all the memories around it and so on. So about that, that much. And I did that, uh, I did about 60% of the design and build the entire thing. I had four technicians working for me, all older than me. So, so instead of a plane, it became a, a, a mini computer. It yeah. became, it became, a, it basically it was, it, it was, it, it, it would, it would have, it was the equivalent of a much faster Cal calculator, programmable calculator, really, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, but it was a general purpose computer, but, it, but the, the intention was to have a 
you know, a fast cal calculating machine mm -hmm. and to see how that would work. So anyway, so that project then, uh, after that project, I decided that it was time for me to go back and study, study physics. And, and you were 19 or 19, So 1961, and okay, yeah. the end of 1961, so 20 years I left. Old. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I just turned, I just turned 20 uh, in, in December. So, um, so I decided to go back to, to go to university, University of Padua. And I wanted to study physics because I, I you know, I study, I study vacuum tubes at the technical high school. Transistors were fairly new in, yeah. in 1960. I, I uh, you know, and these this schools are always five, five or 10 years late in terms yeah. of what they teach with respect to what is the forefront of technology. And of course, transistors in those days were still very slow compared to vacuum tubes. You know, germanium transistors, they, they had a cutoff frequency of, you know, about a megahertz. So, I mean, you know, that or, or a few megahertz. So it, it took silicon to really go the next, yeah. the next leg. Um, and, um, so the uh, uh, so I, I decided though that that was the future. You know, it was very clear to me that was the future. So I wanted to understand quantum physics, understand how the transistors really work, not just using it, you know, but how does it work? Yeah. And uh, and so I went I, I went I did physics instead of engineering, which would have been the more natural thing for me to do. And uh, I never regretted having done that because that was really a, a, a you know, gave me some so, so solid a uh, foundation of uh, mathematics and physics that that you know I could do anything uh, after that you know, of technical nature. So um, after graduation, I went to work uh, for a small company for for uh, less than a year, and then I, I ended up in 1967 at SGS Fairchild. Mm. So uh, it was uh, May of 19, 1967 when when I started, and uh, uh, with the earlier company called Ceres, I, they sent me in Silicon Valley in the summer of 66 to learn MOS transistors because this company had the rep, they were rep of general micro, uh, general microelectronics. It was the first MOS company in the world, mm. starting I think in 60, 65 or early 66. And, uh, and they, they had developed a 100-bit shift register. Can you imagine? A <laughs> 100-bit, they couldn't build it, but they, had, yeah, they, were, yeah, they were. This was the vision. Were, yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, um, so, uh, so I, I spent a week uh, here uh, with a course on MOS and uh, the products of this company. And, and then I went back. But then, then uh, GME was purchased by Philco Ford, that they disappear, and so my job there disappeared. So I went to SGS, and SGS Fairchild uh, had just started an R and D uh, facility. In those days, SGS uh, was uh, the uh, European licensee of bipolar tran bipolar transistors and integrated circuits from Fairchild. Yep. Fairchild had about thirty percent ownership of the company, um, and uh, uh, but they were dependent on products from Fairchild, and so they uh, they decided in early 67 or late 66 to start an R&D uh, facility. I joined them in my first job since I knew everything about MOS, right, of course, <laughs> was to <laughs> was to develop their first MOS process technology, which I did. Yep. I did uh, in about four months, and then I designed two integrated circuits uh, before the end of the year. Uh, one was a 16-bit static shift register, which you know, which it takes a lot more transistors than a dynamic one, and uh, um, and uh, uh, and then a, a, a sort of a, a sort of a gate array with metal that you could design your own. You know, you, you know. Of course, there were only a few gates. So probably, I don't know. They were probably the equivalent of 20 gates or something. You know, maybe you no, know, maybe 40 gates, but right. you know, but that kind of thing. Uh, and that was the, you know, that that takes us to the end of uh, to the end of uh, uh, 67, and then I was sent here for in, a, in an exchange of engineers in early in February of uh, 68 here in Silicon Valley. Here in Silicon Valley to work uh, in the R&D facility of, uh, of Fairchild, and, uh, and so that 
I told you my first life. Yeah, the first exactly. life in Italy, you know, and now we are at the beginning the of, second my, life. of my second life. And, and as we look outside and see all these big buildings in Silicon Valley, when you arrived here, I think it was quite different, no? Yeah, I, I, would, have, I, would, I, would, have, I would have been looking at lots of uh, uh, trees of, you know, uh, apricots, uh, <laughs> walnuts. Orchards of uh, all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. and, and prunes and so on, right? It was, yeah. it was essentially mostly orchards here. Yeah, San Jose, which is a few few blocks away from here, uh, was in those days was uh, probably 150,000 people, and mostly, you know, it, it was in the country, so to speak, yeah. in the agricultural agricultural yeah, area, yeah, yeah. and uh, so you know, it was like a, you wouldn't want to go to San Jose, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and now it's over a million people, so uh, and. So, you know, 50 years have changed this valley in, um, in an unbelievable way. So by 1969, you were still at SGS Fairchild, correct? And then you, you made a move outside, right? Well, you know, at SGS Fairchild, yeah, I was until uh, until 1st of July of 68. Because, because in June, uh, uh, Fairchild decided to sell their interests in SGS Fairchild. They asked me to stay. In those days, I was in the middle of developing the Silicon Gate technology, which is, you, you, you know, is the technology that really changed the way we do integrated circuits, circuits. because it eventually surpassed bipolar and so replaced even bipolar, then in 68, represented 95% of the sales. Yeah. So, so, um, so the Silicon Gate really was the way, the way to go. In one shot, we had five times the speed and twice the density with the same power dissipation, same design rules. I mean, that's a game, big change. Yeah, that was a game changer. game changer. That would allow to make microprocessor, dynamic RAM, because the leakage was uh, about 100 to 1,000 times less than metal yeah, gate yeah. because you could do gathering, yeah. which you couldn't do in metal gate. And then, and then, uh, and then the floating, floating gate transistors, so the, all the non-volatile memories, they needed silicon gate because you needed a good oxide to protect the, you know, as an, an insulator of the yeah. few electrons that you could sneak into this gate. Right, right. But <laughs> so, but everyone was was believing dynamic RAM was was the the priority, not microprocessor. No? Oh, in those days, in those days, uh, most people didn't didn't get it, especially yeah. people in the industry. But who get it were the the customers. They they had a problem. They you know before they had to. To make a hardware solution, typically a state machine, to solve the problem, now they could use the same components and uh, just develop a simple software. So instead of taking two years in order to have a you know a prototype or a year and a half to have a prototype, you know they could do it in a month. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's that, it changed the game. Yeah. Completely. So you decided to stay in. in in decided, Silicon Valley. I decided to stay in Silicon Valley because uh, because you know here here it was was where the action was exactly and uh, um, so that's that, you know I, and I also wanted to finish the Silicon Gate technology it wasn't done yet right. in, uh, in 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 June when I decided to stay. So you had the basis of, of DRAM and microprocessors. So how how did the microprocessor side of that evolve? The microprocessor side evolved by by Intel uh, having a custom deal. Uh, and uh, this custom deal was a, a Japanese customer that wanted to make a, a, a family of calculators, desktop calculators mm. and calculating machines. They had developed their own architecture. They had a three chip CPU. Uh, they were still using uh, uh, serial memories, you know, shift registers, because in those days there was no dynamic RAM yet. Right. So the only low cost memory, read write memory was the shift register. Mm. And uh, uh, but shift register is difficult to, you know, to to handle because, uh, you know, it, it's great for data. If, if you like a terminal or a calculator right. where you can, line, you, can yeah. you can have circulating data. But but when you have, uh, you know, when you have data your programs, uh, you know, what do you do, right? So, so it's, it's kind of a complicated to handle and, uh, and, to, um, and to load programs and so, and so on is, is a co complex thing. So that's why they had three chips. But basically those three chips were, were due to two things. One is that the 
level of integration that was possible in those days was not was not Minimum, sufficient. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and the extra complexity. So, uh, so the those three chips were reduced to one chip by changing the architecture, so that the architecture could uh, could handle RAM yeah. instead of shift registers yeah. as as read write memory, right. uh, which which sa save a lot. But still, you know, it couldn't be done in a single chip. It, you know, the silicon gate was necessary. That change was not done by me. It was done by one of the application people at, at uh, you know, at, at Intel. Though, it, it, you know, the architecture of that computer is kind of, you know, is standard in those days. You know, you, many people knew how to do it. The question was, how do you do it? How can you put 23, 2500 transistors? We didn't know yet. It was between 22, 2500, the estimate. Uh, in a single chip, right. they had to be small enough to be, you know, to make money and so on. And so, so that was my task. I handled all of that. It was, you know, so I was creating the process, in. creating the tools, all the things around. All to, the things around. Uh, yeah, uh, Intel in those days were making memories. Uh, they were just beginning. They were, when I joined, they were just in the middle of uh, making the 1103. It was the first 1,000 bit dynamic RAM. And what year was this then? When they you this joined? This was was sixty uh, 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 1970, 1970. Uh, April, okay. April. So you moved to Intel then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that that was a you know, Intel was a small company. They had probably 120 people, of which uh, you know most of them were workers. You know because they had, they were already in production. They were producing shift registers in those yeah. days and uh, a few memories, but memories were still s slow to be picked up. Also because they were slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Access time 1.5 microseconds. Yeah, yeah. So in the in the book, you were talking about some of the characters you you dealt with in launching the microprocessors. Any interesting stories or people, personalities, obviously that you well, had to deal yeah, with here. Yeah, but you know, I, I I could go on for for hours, <laughs> right? So so I I think that we have so much to talk about. Okay, all we right. Probably better move on. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> So, but this time we're we're around the the, the processor four four zero zero four four zero four, and then of course uh, the four thousand zero four was for, for a, it was a exclusive for customer, but uh, you know and and nobody at Intel thought that it, it it could be useful other than making calculators, and I say no 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 this is excellent to make uh, controllers you know like microcontrollers, right. uh, what now you would do with a microcontroller so uh, so and but it, they won't listen. So, so I actually develop a tester of the 4004 using the 4004 as the controller of the tester, and also the generator of the test pattern of the tester. Interesting. Mm. So mm. that, you know, uh, you know, and so I wanted to figure out how a customer would would have to use these parts because okay. you know, a microprocessor, you 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 know, a, a data data sheet is not enough. You need to have some tools, you know, give some help to the customer. And so, so I learn, I figure out, you know, what needs to be done as an engineer using these parts, uh, other than, you know, the customer that already knew it was tooled up to do that. It was right, right, Visicom, right. a Japanese customer. So, um, so with that, I was able to convince my my bosses to get back to buy back the exclusivity, uh, uh, so that they could sell the. Uh, you know those four chipset, CPU, RAM, ROM, and I/O. So there was there were four chips that would work seamlessly together. And uh, and, and and at that time Bob Noyce was the CEO. And uh, you know I, I you know I even knew that that uh, Busycom was in trouble because Shima, the engineer that was you know came over here to you know to uh, to help out with the with the uh, um, with the design of the of the uh, of the chipset, um, uh, essentially to you know to represent the customer because it was an exclusive uh, uh, deal for them, um, uh, told me that uh, that uh, uh, the company was not doing very well. They were paying too much for the <laughs> for the chipset, and so I so I, I told Bob Noyce that if he would lower the price, he probably would, would get yeah, the exclusive exactly, back. So, exactly. Which. Is exactly what he did, and uh, and so so in November of, of uh, 71, 50 years ago, um, uh, the 4004 was announced, yeah. and uh, I must say, except for the people that knew what computers do, it did very well 
for the people that have had a deed that has something they wanted to solve the problem right and uh, and so it was it was very successful not a not highly successful but very successful pay the bills for uh, the 8008 which was the next also that one started as a custom product it was the first a bit microprocessor in the world which i also directed right. Uh, was still uh, what, what was the customer base for these? It was data point. Data point. Data point. Okay. Data point, which never used it, and so uh, Intel bought back the rights for the architecture, and uh, uh, and then out of that, I I changed the architecture, improved it, and uh, developed the 8080, and it took me nine months to get my managers to let me do it. I figure <laughs> out what the, the, you know, what was needed. So the I, challenges I, of today were the still- challenges was to get, to get, yeah. Still, are so, still present, we're all present all back then. The management is always in the way, you know. Sorry about Obstacles. it. Obstacles, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So anyway, so, so and that, by the way, that was one of the major reasons why I decided to start my own company because, you know, we, uh, you know, look, losing nine months yeah. in, a, in a race because everybody, it after was, the 4004, going, yeah. the 4004 was the first design to show what you can do with silicon gate i mean it, when you have a model before people would say oh silicon gate yeah this is difficult to do who yeah, cares it doesn't do anything better yes. than the others you know that kind of stuff right so now they see it they say they can test it say, oh my god you know we got to do something right so when when the 8080 came out which was early uh, 74 and we had lost nine months yeah. of lead six months later the 6800 of motorola came out yes. it was the first microprocessor of, you know. So competition that, that was, was competition. Yeah. yeah, and it was well done. And, uh, and it, you know, so we, we, we risk losing the leadership that took took me so, so much, yeah. you know, my effort to, to, to get it out, to, to, to do it, because when I started with the 4004, Intel was six months late because they didn't, nobody knew how to do it. And so they hired me to do it, okay. And uh, but they lost six months, and uh, and so uh, so this so, time you you went so I, I, I had to your work own. Yeah. I, no I had to work eighty hours a week yes. to, to make up for the for some of the delay of yep. course I couldn't yep. make up everything, and uh, and so you know n now we we lose nine months because you know or we cannot figure out what to do I mean come on right so so I decided that's it that's enough I I'm going to go start my own company so I started Zilo, which uh, and and then I came up with the idea of the Z80. Which was which, very as successful. You know, was, it's still in yes. volume production today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Z80, we uh, actually, I was looking back at the evolution of, of SGS Thompson, and one of the acquisitions made was a company called Mostech. Yeah. And earlier in this week, I was in uh, our facility in, in Capel, uh, which is really kind of a, a genesis of um, Carrollton, where we acquired fabs through this company. And one of the interesting things I saw from Mostech is they they had uh, a second source agreement for the Z80, yeah. and they also had the rights to the x86 architecture. Yeah. And I find it interesting that uh, around the same time, had they, you know, it'd be interesting to see because you're tied in with both yeah. that being the, the founder of Z80, um, they went down a path of DRAM rather than capitalizing on the x86, yeah. which Intel eventually uh, capitalized on. What would you think, or do you think, Moztec and SGS Thompson could have gone down the x86 path and, instead of the DRAM? Well, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they certainly could have, could have done probably as good than AMD did, yeah. which, you know, as you know, AMD also eventually got the the uh, the license for uh, do, from, yeah. from Intel, uh, but uh, Mostec uh, was better off process-wise than AMD in those days. Yeah. So they probably could have done better. Better. Though there was there was room to maneuver with a microprocessor right. like uh, like the 8086 uh, because you know the price was fairly high, so you could you know you, you were not so tied to yield. Right. But also Mostec was a was a memory company. Right. Most, most the DRAM was was, was, the, the, was it. That was it. The DRAM they they. Frankly, they did the best four, you know, 4K DRAM after the 1103. Right. So Intel had to kind of rush to rush. do. You know, but then the Japanese uh, semiconductor the Japanese came, came in, in and, and they it was really, over. you know, destroyed the, the ecosystem here. The, the only the only survivor is Micron. Yeah, exactly. The only, the only survivor is Micron. Everybody got out except yeah. for Micron. 
So the Z80 though was extremely. Uh, but the, the Z80, you know, but but you know, I must say that you probably don't don't know, but I gave the license to 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 SGS yeah. uh, for the Z80 also. Uh, Paletto was uh, engineer Paletto was the CEO in those days, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, and that was uh, probably seventy. Uh, 77, 78, 77, more, 77, 78. Yeah. You know, that's when I gave this the license of uh, to to uh, and also the Z8 license right. to uh, to SGS. So how did that Z80 success translate then to your your next move from the log? Well, I mean, you know, then we did the Z8000, uh, and the Z8000 was certainly better than the 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 8086. But then you know, but then. The problem with that, with Zilog was that we have an investor that wanted to compete with IBM, and IBM has said no products of Zilog in this con in this company. So they choose the wrong side. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well. And so you know, so but but actually this this is true. I mean that's right. what happened, and so you know basically we we were cut sure. off from the most lucrative and the, because. Intel in those days, they had lost the leadership with the Z80. Yeah. The yeah, Z80 yeah. had taken the market over with the 8080 was just, uh, you know, disappearing right. rapidly. So, so and the Z8000 was much better than right. the 8086. So, so really, I mean, uh, there was, it would have been game over if it wasn't for IBM. And then you went to into a telecommunication application. Then I correct? then then my next company was uh, yeah was uh, Signet Technologies to develop a very smart telephone for data and voice. You could you could send the screen and talk at the same time. I mean, something that that in ni 1984 was unheard of. Yeah. So, but was too soon. And and besides, in '84 the entire communication ecosystem was was upset by the breakup of AT&T. Ah. So. And of course, that I didn't see it coming because. And then you went on to found Synaptics. No? Then I found the Synaptics, working on neural networks. Uh, I wanted to make computers that learn, and and was then, uh, and, and it was a time when uh, the people that knew about AI they were they were looking at us like, huh, what stupid <laughs> thing to do? Exactly. Neural networks. Everybody yeah. knows that they don't work, yes. right? Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Well, that's not true because, as you know, you know. Starting from 10 years ago, neural networks saved the day of AI because uh, up until 10 years ago, AI with expert systems, their own methodology, never could solve the problems of complex pattern recognition. Yeah. So, so it, you know, I was convinced that uh, the neural network could do the job. Mm. Uh, it could do it very well, and I, I, you know, and the solution was analog in those days because it was the only way to have the 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 uh, you know the density the, the computational power with with two transistors it, it could have been done with one but two transistors multiply add floating floating gate Gates, storage yeah. therefore a non volatile storage for learning and and, and and storing the value and you could you know you could do uh, you know these things billions of operations per second when you know you couldn't do it in the in, in, 80, in 86 87 88 you couldn't do it with digital, you know, with simulation. So we were we were making emulators of neural networks, mm -hmm. not simulators of neural networks, which is what people do today. And and how did you come up with the name Synaptics? Synapse. Synapse. It's the same. Yeah. Uh, synapse is is that transistor yeah. floating gate transistor yeah. was the synapse yeah. was the was the emulation of the synapse of the of the neural network. Yeah. So we're now we're now designing in CMOS process a three nanometer. Yeah. How how did we get from from here, <laughs> from 1969 to uh, 70 to to now, yeah, to this type of uh, three nanometer uh, CMOS process technology, because MOS are surface devices. It's scalable. You can you can squeeze yeah. you can you can reduce the size of bipolar. Bipolar are three dimensional yeah. devices. Yes, they are bulk devices. So you you can you can you know reduce the size. So the this reduction gradual reduction of size was what allowed to go faster denser lower cost com combined with larger wafer sizes so um so we you know we are talking about a a process that essentially for 50 years has been you know has been driving this uh industry yeah. 
unfortunately, we are close to the end of this line. Yep. So, uh, you know, three nanometers, three nanometers I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, the, the next, uh, the next step is, uh, you know, square root of three, so yeah. 1.7 nanometers. I don't know that anybody knows how to do that. Uh, and but, the, and but, the cost, the $250 million for a lithography machine. When you first created the process, how, how much did those machines? $25,000. Uh, $25,000. <laughs> big scale. It, 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 it way for a liner yeah. was, was $25,000. I mean, the, you know, the, the contact lasts were more like 40000 but, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's just uh, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, oh. I mean you, you could, you know, anybody could make his own fab. Now, yeah. how, how can you, you know, you have to shell out $10 billion for fab. Right. So what do you do? So you talked about planes. Uh, one of uh, the key pillars of, of ST was Bruno Marari, and he yep. also was very interested in, in planes. What, do you have any like personal stories or interactions with the, the people like Pasquale Pastorio or Bruno? Of course, or yeah, yeah. With ST? Actually, with, with Bruno, you know, uh, uh, Bruno, we went to Germany together to present uh, some ideas on neural networks because uh, you know at the time when I was uh, CEO of uh, of Synaptics, um, because uh, you know he was interested in neural networks in, as well, and so uh, you know and I you know I we were there was nothing that we, I consider proprietary in, in those days. We were just playing with you know stuff. So uh, so you know and I, and I got to know him much more. I only had met him before when I was working in '67. Uh, 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 because it was an application in those days, uh, but then it became a, a force, and, you know, an, an innovator within yeah. within uh, within SGS and ST. Um, and I I always have high respect for yeah. him. Yeah. And and uh, Pasquale actually at one point uh, I, I interview him to take over to become CEO of, of Synaptics. <laughs> But his wife wanted to go back to Italy. Italy, so so there you go. <laughs> so. That would have been an interesting uh, evolution of both companies. Actually, this. actually, he would have done better than I because he was senior, and he understood much more about you know. I mean, he, he, he had worked for Motorola, so he had a broader view. It would have been the the right thing to do. But. So being here in Silicon Valley for for 50 years, I mean, how have you seen it evolve? I mean, we've seen one of the Founders like Hewlett Packard, uh, you know, start up here, and certainly HP is a different company today than they were back then. You have, uh, you know, Apple came, left, came back in a big way. Obviously, yeah. how how have you seen the the valley here uh, evolve over well, your the, time? The, the, the valley the valley evolve uh, by by fundamentally picking up everything adjacent to semiconductors because because even hp hp was instrumentations essentially in those days just uh, in measurement they, yeah they you know they had begun to use uh to uh to make calculators you know they made yeah. the first slide rule yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but but they were essentially a, an engineering company but the culture of the company uh, was not really one to spin out companies mm. And so, you know, so I, I don't think that in those days there was a single company that came out of people that work for, uh, you know, for uh, uh, for for uh, HP. But but Fairchild was one of the first companies that was financed by venture capital, uh, but also by, you know, it was a division of uh, Fairchild Camera and Instrument in those days. Uh, and so he had a little bit of money from. Out, out, you know, outside, uh, outside uh, Fairchild uh, camera, the parent company, uh, and money from the parent company. So it, it was a more uh, entrepreneurial environment, and it was really Fairchild the span of many children, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so Fairchild became, and also the technology was moving so fast that that the Fairchild could not keep up with it. So, so people were disgruntled. They said, I mean, I mean, this is important. We got, you know, so they would start their own company, exactly like I did later myself. And uh, this was because of the venture capital or because it attracted the, venture the capital, culture? You know, they they the co-evolved, right? Venture yeah. capital co-evolved with the success of these companies. Yeah. And so so the whole thing grew out of there. But then, you know, then the microprocessor came and that really, again, <laughs> created an enormous up. number of new applications, new possibilities. You know, with the personal computer being one of one of them early on, uh, and so 
all this ecosystem of personal computers, yeah. Yeah. software. Yeah. The software. The, there was no software yeah. industry before because because you know there were few companies that were selling computers, and you either develop your own software or you would have the software from from IBM. There was right. you know, no commercial software, yeah, no exactly. no shrink wrap software, right? So, so that that was uh, that was, again. So that was a big deal. Then there was another thing that started in uh, in the early uh, 70s. It, it was. Uh, um, uh, was Genentech, the first company in biotech. Yeah. So the a new, and this came out of out of Stanford work, Stanford University work. And so that was a new major uh, wave that spun all kinds of, you know, biotech and, and Stanford, I think medicine said a lot of this as a university, you know, because yeah. Sun Microsystems and, yeah. and others. And, and, and in some ways, Stanford, you know, uh, there was a professor called Terman, Fred Terman, uh, he was the dean of of, uh, of of the university at one point, and uh, and he was the one that was actually actually encouraging uh, the the students, uh, you know, to to stay here to start activities here. In fact, he, you know, he encouraged uh, uh, he encouraged uh, uh, Hewlett and Packard, uh, Bill Hewlett and, and David Packard to start Hewlett Packard in 1939. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, so. So the culture he had developed, and with the success and the opportunities that were mushrooming, uh, you know, by the by the end of the 70s, it was a, you know Ooh. it was really booming, right? And uh, now, you know, from a portion of Santa Clara County, now Silicon Valley is the entire Bay Area, Bay Area. seven million people. Yeah, San Francisco, Ecosystem. East Bay, San South Francisco Bay, East, uh, it's everywhere, yeah. Around yeah. Yeah. everywhere around here. Everywhere around here. You know, so you find buildings like you you have outside you see outside here you know all over yeah. uh, and you know one thing that I could never have imagined it would have happened is that this the valley innovated even in the cars yes <laughs> Tesla yeah. Yeah. was born yeah. here exactly and yeah. Tesla did the right thing meaning you start with a fresh Piece of paper. Exactly. Instead of bolting an, an an electrical engine on a car that was designed for a gas engine, you start over. over. You say, "This is a new technology." This is how you how disrupt. You, that's right. You're not that's you're right. you're you're not tied to the past. A lot of the German car makers couldn't they could, start with a but, with a clean slate. But, but but even the Americans. Yeah. I mean, you know, they they could they couldn't because yeah. you know the, the, the mindset it's, has to change, and this is the mindset yeah. that made the valley successful. Yeah. This. The capacity to innovate start yeah. here. Yeah, not exactly. start with something and figuring out what to add to something that exists. You start here. Yeah. So being an entrepreneur and mentioning Tesla, you have you know Elon Musk. You have in the past uh, you know different different types of entrepreneurs uh, making big contribution. Yeah. Is there fundamental things that entrepreneurs share together, uh, or are there different things depending on the timing, the the technology? Being here in the valley and being an entrepreneur yourself, what what are those ingredients that you see? Well, I mean, is this desire to innovate, you know, and the pleasure to innovate? Because you know, it isn't just the desire, you know, and and, and through innovation, you 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 can change the world. Yeah, and, and so. You know, it's not just making money. I mean, some want to be entrepreneurs because they, you know, that's the only way to get rich. Right. But, but, but that's a minority. Uh, the, the, here, people come here with their eyes, you know, you know, uh, you know, open illuminated, and ready to, illuminated. Yes, you what know, I the, the, what the, I can do. What I can do, right? And I, it, how how can I change? How can I make something that that nobody has ever made before? You know, that that is what made the, the valley you know the spirit of it call it entrepreneurship uh, but also a deeper sense that you can do it yeah. you can make it you know and, and everything is here to allow you to make it which unfortunately very few other parts in the world have you know the money the the yeah. the infrastructure the services the uh, you know the people that you can hire and, and take from other people. Sorry. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> exactly. And, and so on, right? But there's very few obstacles. I mean, you want to start your own company, you can do that in a few days. You know, there's yeah. very few places 
where there's the bureaucracy is is completely oh, absolutely. removed. E everything everything helps you instead of hindering you. Yeah, in exactly. some countries, you know, you're hinder. You don't, you know, yeah. you can, you know, you cannot do anything new because just to in incorporate a company yeah. it takes three months. Yeah. Come on, you it's know, too long. Yeah. So you talk about artificial neural networks, uh, AI. Uh, you know, I, I, there was a very famous, I think, uh, debate between Jack Ma and uh, Elon Musk about what's the future of AI and these types of things. Uh, I, I like this this TV show called The Person of Interest, and it, it's following kind of this this uh, um, idea that once created by man, artificial intelligence systems can start to take over public and private uh, data systems. Yep. What's your thoughts on this? How 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 you how do you see this evolving over the next 20 years? How much time do we have? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Are we. <laughs> Yeah, we have to catch up. Okay, <laughs> but what, what do you think? I mean, what is the short uh, answer? Never. Never. AI will do much better than we do with our rational mind, but the rational slash mechanical mind. Mm. But we are conscious beings, and consciousness is not a property of computers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, consciousness is a quantum property is not a, a is a property of qubits which are entangled yeah. and entanglement is the difference between quantum and classical in classical you have bits in quantum you have qubits the best that you can do moving from quantum to classical is a qubit which is an infinity of states there are will be will be points in a surface of a sphere yeah. that will be you know the, it's called the block sphere. Okay, so those points in the surface of the sphere reduce in this physical world, in this space time, zero and one. That's it. So that's how differ, different is consciousness. And consciousness, of course, is the capacity to feel, to know within ourselves. Not within, meaning in the heart or right. the brain, or not in the physical. The within is another dimension, is the dimension which is the, the Hilbert space, corresponds to the Hilbert space of quantum physics. The Hilbert space is an n-dimensional space where each core, each coordinate is complex number, not a real number. So because of that, you can create situations in which the sum of the parts is more than the sum of the parts, which, you know, is twisted, yes. but is twisted like quantum mechanics is twisted. A particle, an electron is both a particle and a wave. Go figure, right? What does it mean? It means that an electron is a system. It cannot be an atom like, you know, the atoms of Democritus, you know, bounded, little hard with certain properties and so on. No. The electrons are systems that behave, when we measure them here, right. behave like a particle, like if it was an atom, okay? But when they interact, they share states. That's entanglement. They share something. And these states that are shared are independent from the distance. Therefore, when I change, when I measure something here, immediately something here happens. That's magic. Mm -hmm. no, no, no time to move from information from here to there mm. instantaneously. So this is the property that is inherent in our consciousness yeah. and also in our free will. Right. In a theory which I have developed with a famous uh, physicist, uh, Italian physicist, is a, is a, is a specialist in quantum, phys in, uh, in quantum information. Uh, uh, the, the actual collapse of the wave function which is how a, a quantum state becomes a physical state in right. space-time. Yeah. So you, you go from many to one, many states possible in superposition to one. That occurs by virtue of the free will. The free will makes that conversion. Mm. Mm. So that's a revolutionary view. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it, uh, this will become a, a chapter in the book that will come out in a month or two. 
and uh, it, it is a paper available in uh, an archive already, uh, but as a you know uh, a preprint. So so this theory is really the first theory of consciousness and free will, which goes against the grain of how people are thinking. Typically, scientists are thinking about uh, quantum, classical, and you know, and free will in particular. But you're marrying philosophy and physics no, together. No, this, this is physics. But you talk about this free will. Physics. Free will is, is free will is not free will. You free. call it you call it a physics. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It is it, it is free will. It, it is physics in this model in this theory. In the model, it is physics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It is physics. So how does that consciousness interface? It basically, basically, but but it is already that in in a way is already known. But nobody wants, nobody accepts it because somehow people do not like free will. Free will. Because if, if if reality has free will, it means that if you know, you you are not better than anybody right. else, right? And this is why the artificial intelligence, which lacks free will, can never artificial intelligence can never is deterministic, take over. yeah, no free will. Yeah, exactly. The sum of the parts is the whole. In in a computer, the sum of the parts, which are the the parts are the, the algorithms that interact. The interaction, the interaction is the sum of the parts, which are the algorithms. The sum of the algorithms is all there is. There is no whole as an independent entity that can affect the parts. Mm -hmm. But in quantum physics, you can. In quantum physics, when you have this this superposition and entanglement, new entanglement creates new holes that are more than the sum of the parts. Mm. And that's what nobody had before understood. That's part of this paper, part yeah, of this theory. Yeah. So that human to, to machine interface, if, if we go back to synaptics and one of the big inventions was the touch controller, where you have a human to machine interface. Mm -hmm. and, and it, what you're talking yeah. about now is something much, much, oh, man, it's taking I mean, this to the, to the extreme. I mean, man, this but is, is it the same kind of process of human to machine uh, interaction that no, uh, well, no, no, this, this is, this is, I mean, this it's, is it's what, way beyond. This right? is what makes us human. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is big, right? Because, because science and today is telling us that we are machines. We are biological complex machines. That's it. There is no consciousness other than the functioning of the machine. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, the function of the machine is the correlate of something that involves consciousness driving this machine. We are controlled by this entity that we really are. Yes. We are a quantum entity. We, we think that we are the body, but we are this quantum entity that controls the body. Yeah. Big difference. I mean, we, uh, this theory returns, returns power to human beings that the people that tell you that you are a machine are taken away from you. Yes. If you are a machine, what the hell are you going to do? I yeah. mean. The, the, you know, especially if the machines are smarter in the mechanical sense, controlled by smarter people, people than you, exactly. they, they know that they are not machines perhaps, but in any event, they want to control you through the machines that they make. Right. Come on. I mean, we have to wake up. This is what's going on today. So how do we manage these machines in the future? You regulate? Uh, well, there, there has to be some, some, some form of regulation, obviously, because, yeah. because uh, you know, because you, you can imagine how much mischief you can do yes. if you control those machines. With these smart people. These smart people <laughs> behind, uh, they, they control them, and, but they pretend that they are not, they are not, that they're the machines innocent. are, they yes. are yeah, I'm innocent, yes. yeah, but they, they, you know, they, right. yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. This, uh, I see you very animated, <laughs> and this, this is the exciting part of the book. Uh, I don't know, Sergio, if you want to take some question uh, as we, as we move through this, because I think this, this portion of, of the discussion of the book, I find really extremely interesting. He, you want to come to the to the? We haven't had the question specifically for that, so I don't know if we want to go back a little bit. That's or, fine. Or we um, become uh, Sergio and the camera. So one of the question was, um, in your opinion, what will be the biggest innovation to come in the next ten years? And maybe this one you can, sorry, practice. So. <laughs> no, okay. Being no, I, safe. I, I, I can hear you better if you. Can. In your opinion, what will be the biggest innovation to come in the next ten years? And actually, 
what do you will see your theory of consciousness going in 10 years from now? You are talking about the next yeah. book. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I yeah, the, you know, my hope would be that in 10 years, a sufficient number of people understand what I'm talking about because returning meaning and purpose to human life is the most important innovation that we need. Okay, technological innovation, great. They are, they, they, they are continue to occur, they will take their course, but if we do not evolve our consciousness and the sense of who we are, we are doomed because this technology otherwise will be used against us. Okay, that's, that's it. Perfect. As simple as that. Okay, so reading another question here. Who do you think will be the most influential um, person or agency into this uh, uh, new innovation process? Well, I mean, the, the, I mean basically, the, the people that are awakening, that understand that we are not machines, and they want to understand who are we, really and beginning to move in a direction of personal discovery. This, this job has to be done by each one of us. It cannot be done by reading a book and repeating what you read. You got to do it within yourself. Each, each of us need to understand who we are within ourselves. That's the only way that is going to work. Because only within yourself you know if what you perceive is right or wrong. And you know it Absolutely. If you are really serious about it and you want to know, you will know. The same way that happened to me 30 years ago, I was unhappy about my life after having achieved everything. They should, the world says that if you do this, you should be very happy, you know, and I wasn't. It was the time of, I was studying consciousness study uh, neural networks, uh, neuroscience, biology, and so on. I wanted to understand this stuff. And I had a major, you know, an opening where basically, you know, is in the book, you know, I, I cannot, there's not time to, to tell, but basically I experienced myself as the world that observes itself. Now, that, that's a mind bender. How, how can you be the world that observes itself? You, you have to experience that. You, you, it's not something that is logical. Exactly like quantum physics is non-logical. How can an electron be a particle and a wave? Exactly the same problem. And I experience me as a particle, the observer, mm -hmm. and the wave, the world. This is very interesting because the next question that we receive, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, unusual for, for the environment of engineering, but uh, what is your view on soul versus consciousness? Is, conscious, is consciousness, in your words, the same as soul in many philosophers? Uh, the consciousness is the capacity to experience through feelings and sensations. What, what philosophers call qualia, the fact that I, I know, not because I have signals in the brain, a computer has signals in the brain and it does whatever it does, it goes from signals to action, no, nobody home there no feelings, no sense of self, no sense of the world, no understanding of what it's doing. But we have, between the signals and the experience of the signals, which is qualia, something happens, okay? That capacity is not in this physical world. It is in another physical world, which is the world, the quantum world I was mentioning before. So it's like, look, Suppose that you are controlling a character in a computer, right? You know, like a you know, like a video game, right? But 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 not with joysticks. You know, you ha you have a costume that every mo movement that you make is automatically taken, so that you actually the you know the, yeah. the character simply does what you do without you having to think about it. Then you have your goggles. You see in 3D the virtual world, and you hear the voices of people there, and 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 you know. And, uh, and your voice is heard. So suppose that you are in this environment, okay? Now, you have a sense, you, you basically think that you are in a, in, a, in a real world. I mean, you see space mm. 
you see space. But what's, where is the space? The space in the virtual world is not this space. It's the space created by the computer. Mm. But you perceive space. Oh. You move, you do, you do stuff. You can even get so enthralled or so, you know, so you know, are captivated by the game that you forget that you are actually in this world, yeah. especially if you are a kid, right? And so all of a sudden, your consciousness is focused on only that reality, okay? But where is the experience? Yeah. Where is the reality? Is it in the computer? Yeah. Is it in the character of the computer? No, it's in you, mm. all right? Now let's make it another step now. My consciousness of this physical world is not in me. It is in that entity, quantum entity, that where the experience resides. Yeah. So my body is like the avatar in the computer. But have you seen the, the Marvel movie Ant-Man, where the guy goes back into the quantum realm? It sounds like we're, we're, we're in this space. It cannot, if you it, haven't seen it, it you cannot, need to. <laughs> but the point is they cannot go back to the quantum realm. Yeah. You see, that, that's the old point. The right. old point is that there is, you know, a, a, you know, is a irreversible, irreversible right. Right. transformation. Right. I mean, the quantum world is many dimensions, yeah. n dimensions. That's where we have the experience. Right. So, I mean, people don't understand quantum. Mm. That's the problem. But everybody says quantum. But you know, but saying quantum and understanding quantum, two different things. Yeah. Maybe, Sergio, if I go back to your first question, the answer to that, from from what I heard, is. It's like the innovation. It's not going to come from a government agency. It's not going to come from a market leader. It's going to come from just like everything else in innovation from an entrepreneur who understands the, these types of things. Yeah, but they, but they, yeah, they, 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 because the, the entrepreneur translates something. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, you know, translates something that is in his mind into a product, an idea that is, uh, you know, there are words or pictures or images or what have you. So an entrepreneur, uh, you know, is essentially a, a translator from a higher mind, a higher mind where there is intention, purpose, and ideas Competence. into <laughs> symbolic form, yeah. which can be a product. You know, you know, a, 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 this is a symbol. In my model, this is a symbol. Right. My body is a symbol, mm. but my consciousness is not in the body. Mm. Okay, so. So, uh, it, 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 but really, it, just the the analogy or the metaphor of the you know the virtual reality that I made before can can get you pretty close to understanding what I'm talking about because when you control a character, the experience of that world created by the computer, the experience and of the character that you are embodying is not in the computer nor in the character. You see. Mm -hmm. So that tells you immediately that we are play playing the same game in this physical world. This physical world is our construction. We are constructing this. Mm -hmm. And we think that we are living in it, but we are constructing it. The body is living in it, but the experience is not in this physical reality, is not in, in 3 plus 1D. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's, how, that's how powerful this is. Mm -hmm. You, Paul, and, and you, Federico, <coughs> have just uh, uh, answered the, answer the other question. <laughs> <laughs> For someone just starting a career of engineering, where should they focus? I think this, this is exactly you know, the focus that we... I mean, but they, they should focus in what they really feel like that they want to do. The passion. I mean, the passion. What they're I mean, passionate about it. Exactly. Absolutely. Passion. The passion and, and, and the desire. And the, that, that's really what drives everything. Is the, is the desire to do something and and then you know and then you take the you know the rest of it goes with it but if you don't have the desire you know having, having started and founded uh, uh, a few companies you know it's such a cliche but I, I have to ask how, how do market leaders or established companies allow for this type of entrepreneurial spirit how do they break down the the natural bureaucracies that you know force people to leave the company and start their own uh, own ideas their own company uh, what well, i mean uh, frankly they shouldn't even try to do that because because it, it is inherent in a structure when it's, it reaches a certain level that 
the you know the number of uh, of entrepreneurial spirit on average decreases yeah. right because you need more doing than than you know inventing new things so you you need inventing too of course but percentage wise you know that not naturally decreases and so you know by people going out they provide new innovation that serve the company that let those people go out too yeah. in fact you you know you can acquire the company then later if, yeah. if they are successful and let go the ones that were not so successful. the best way is to to spin it out to give them maximum freedom and well, you, you, don't you, try to manage in your corporate process well no you you, you should you, know, you should manage the innovation necessary to go to the you know to the adjacency of the market in which you are you know you're you are operating of course you don't want to let that go yeah. but yeah. so you you need to maintain that ability to innovate but but you know but 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 you know you you cannot do everything and many people can have ideas that are not necessarily what the company should be doing so let them go i mean let them go do their stuff and then and then maybe five years later there is this company has done something that you didn't see right. and then you right. you, you can right. buy that company back exactly. right exactly. in fact many 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 uh, uh many uh, small companies startup companies end up being bought by by a larger company so, so elon musk just did this with solar city right he just they, they spun it out they created some things and then yeah. they just bought tesla just bought them back then you buy it back yeah. Because because it, it it takes it takes a different environment, you know, a, a larger company becomes more bureaucratic. You know, an entrepreneur hates bureaucracy. Yes. He is he want to get things yes. done, like me. You know. yes. <laughs> yes. Knock it down. <laughs> any any other question from you? No, just to thank uh, Federico for the time. I mean, this is the book Silicon. Yes, and it uh, is is available on Amazon. And uh, you can also, but also in Italian. It, also in Italian, Italian. Yeah. Italian is published yeah. uh, published also in Italian. And uh, uh, you have also a website, right? Uh, SiliconTheBook.com. Yeah. So if you want to uh, buy the book and read the other interesting story uh, inside the book, uh, please do so at Amazon. Yeah. And uh, I. I just want to thank you, Sergio, for putting this together. This was this was really great. And Federico, again, thank you, Sergio. Thank, yeah. you. thank you for the for your time. Well, it's, it's been my pleasure. I always, always, always be happy to hear Federico. Uh, he's a very interesting person, as we, you know, have seen here. And I was, you know, reading our uh, our the sentence here. Our technology starts with you. I think that is most appropriate that we can <laughs> ever choose having here Federico today. And uh, we, I mean, I extend the invitation for your next book to present uh, our, uh, I mean, the book next again year. here. Next you are year. always welcome here <laughs> in Santa Clara. You are our neighbor and uh, please visit us anytime you want. Very Thank good. you, Federico. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.